Today's scripture reading is 1 Samuel 16, verses 1 through 13. It can be found on the overhead screen and in your few Bibles. <laughs> Let us have a prayer. Our Lord and our God, now as we hear your word, fill us with your spirit. Soften our hearts that we may delight in your presence. Sharpen our minds that we may discern your truth. Shape our wills that we may desire your ways. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the word of God. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to see Jesse the Bethlehem, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peacefully? He said, Peacefully. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on his, the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And Jesse called Abinabad and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes, and he was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mighty, mightily down upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. The word of the Lord. <laughs> Well, thank you for a terrific reading of the anointing of David, who would go on to be the king of Israel. And I can't help but think that David, uh, the mighty king of Israel, would look to our backpack program and say, 90 backpacks? Oh, you good people at Covenant, you can do 100 backpacks. That will make it easier for Camille to distribute between four schools. Our New Testament reading comes to us from Paul's letter to the church in Rome, chapter 7, verses 14 through 25. Listen again to God's word. Paul writes, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold into slavery unto sin. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. 
Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer that I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I can't do it. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want to do is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer that I do, that does it, but sin that dwells within me. So Paul continues, I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. <coughs> Thanks be to God. I didn't finish that last verse. Sorry about that. I have a confession to make to y'all, as we say in West Virginia. Being a pastor is one of the weirdest jobs in the world. I've learned about our dumpster at Covenant for the past few weeks. We've been noticing that uh, as we've dumped a lot of the things into the dumpster that it smells and we were like, wasn't there like some lids on the dumpster? So we call the dumpster company and we find out that our old dumpster was broken so they gave us a replacement so we can get a new dumpster with lids. And then the neighbors call and they say, you know, your dumpster really smells. And I say, well, you know, what do you expect? It's a dumpster. So we're working <laughs> all that out, right? It's a weird job. They, they, they taught me to preach. They did not teach me how to deal with dumpsters. <laughs> but in the oddities of my job, there are incredible blessings. And I want to tell you about this experience where I just can almost reach out and touch the spirit and the air that surrounded me. I was called um, to a hospice facility. And a man had been transferred to hospice in his final days, and death was imminent. I sat next to his wife of over 60 years, and the son, and they loaded this man, they filled him with morphine so his passing could be uh, with peace and comfort and not experiencing the excruciating pain that comes with the sort of death he was going to encounter. So the four of us were sitting around, chatting about the man's life, all of his experiences as a father. And I just love to hear the son tell stories of how dad taught, not necessarily through anger or violence or through whipping, but through showing his son <coughs> and the faithfulness of his life, how to be a good man. It's beautiful. I love listening to the wife share stories of husband's involvement in the church, how he had uh, outlasted five pastors, and I got to be the sixth pastor. Uh, and she was sharing with husband, we've got another young one here with us. And it was oh, just wonderful. And all of a sudden, husband, father, uh, comes to lucidity and struggling through the gurgles of the water that was filling his lungs. It was hard to understand. But I saw a son, I saw a wife rush to his side. And son, he looked, oh, I'm gonna cry, it was so special. <laughs> Grabbed his father's face and looked him in the eyes and said, I love you. You have taught me so well. The spirit of love that you gave to me will live on through me grandchildren, and it is okay for you to go on. It was holy and reverenced by the tears of my eyes today. Some of you may have experienced these moments on the deathbed, where the Spirit of God is so close that you can feel it 
when the hair raises on the back of your neck or you feel this peace inside of your heart. That day, the family used many words to describe husband, father, grandfather, uncle. As we think about our own lives, there are many words that we can share to describe ourselves, right? We're really good at being able to describe ourselves with labels as we relate to one another or relate to our family. Uh, some of those labels could be Republican or Democrat. There must be a room of Republicans in there, right? <laughs> some of the words we could use would be rich or poor. Some of the words we could use would be Steelers fans or Cowboys. <laughs> All of those are incorrect. The correct answer would be you're wrong. <laughs> There are many words we can use to describe ourselves as we relate to one another, relate to society, um, but there are better words as you relate to family, father, mother, sister, brother, loving, patient, kind. But as we sat around the room, uh, as husband, father was preparing to meet his Savior, we pondered, what does it feel like? What are the words we use when we prepare to meet our Lord and Savior? Before we answer that question, I want to tell you a story about uh, another pastor whose works that I've read, I've never encountered the Reverend Nadia Bowles, but she's about 11 years older than I am growing up in the suburbs of Denver. And uh, when Nadia was 17, uh, she did what some 17-year-olds do, encounter <coughs> partying and drinking and rebellion toward God. She spent 11 years as an alcoholic uh, and addicted to drugs. During those years, she filled her body with tattoos. Uh, but 11 years later, she had an experience with our Lord Jesus Christ. And alcoholic, drug-addicted Nadia, gave her life to Jesus. And today, she is a famous author. I encourage you to read her books, Nadia Bowles Weber. Um, but around 1995, no, it was 2000 or so, Nadia went to found a church in Denver uh, under the umbrella of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America called The House for All Saints and Sinners. And at the House of All Saints and Sinners, Nadia tattooed openly, I am a recovering addict, Reverend Nadia Bowles Weber, welcome into the House for All Saints and Sinners, everyone who needed something more. So today in worship in Denver, you can find um, maybe drug addicts who are looking for Jesus. Find some good, uh, well-to-do white people just like me and you, but it is an eclectic crowd of people gathered around Jesus. Now I've said the phrase House for All Saints and Sinners a lot, right? If you take the acronym of that, H-F-A-S-S, -S, and the House for All Saints and Sinners and the reality of their worship where people are addicted, they often refer to themselves as half-ass. H-F-A-S-S, -S, right? <laughs> and, and so often um, I bring that up not to be edgy, but I wonder if, as we consider our lives before God, if that may be a way in which we live. Half ass. Or, let's dig a little deeper and more seriously saints and sinners. During the Protestant Reformation, uh, the reformer Martin Luther came up with this idea of how we are to understand ourselves as we relate to God Almighty. Uh, it's this Latin phrase, simul justice and peccator, which many of you are probably aware that Luther believes that simultaneously, simul, simultaneously we are just, we are righteous in front of God, and it should be an et as I transcribe that, uh, peccator, sinner, simultaneously, Luther believes that we are justified by Jesus Christ, that we are saints in the eyes of God, and at the same time, we are 
sinners in every way that we can imagine as we stand before God. So if we are simultaneously justified and sinners at the same time, I wonder why it is that so many of us have so much anxiety in our lives if we can be both at the same time. So often we turn to the Bible for the heroes of our faith to figure out how we can live our lives as well. But I want you to be mindful that as we do this, almost every single person we encounter in our Holy Scriptures is simultaneously a sinner, simultaneously justified, all at the same time. Phil read to us from Samuel telling us the story of King David. And as we look over Israelite history, uh, King David is the man. Today, if you fly El Al Airlines, the airline of Israel, you can upgrade to the King David class, first class of comfort. King David was the hero of our Israelites and sisters in their faith. This is because he was able to do so much with the anointing of God as Phil read to us today. So while he was a hero and had a heart after God, King David also did some pretty shady things in his life, right? Uh, many of us are familiar with the story of Bathsheba. How he committed adultery with another man's wife. And then to cover up this sin, he goes and has Bathsheba's husband uh, killed in the front lines of battle. Later on, as David's children are growing up, we see how David is not the best father and allows them kind of to do whatever they would like to do. Simultaneously, while King David uh, was a saint in many of the eyes of the people, he was also uh, a sinner. Today, I want us to focus on the sinner portion of Luther's formula for how we are to understand ourselves, and I really don't have to preach much on this, because in encounters not just with you, but just with human beings, the struggles that we all go through, you good Presbyterian people, are all together real. Paul says this in chapter 3 of Romans, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And even Paul wrestled with his sins as well. We wrestled with our sins. A few weeks ago, we did this exercise in worship. Some of you will remember uh, where we call upon the name of the Lord Jesus to save us from blank. And you were invited to fill in the blank and give that as an offering to God before we took communion. Does anyone remember that? Yeah. Uh, because they were all anonymous, I took the pastoral liberty of reading through those, um, knowing that I would not know who they were from. But I can get a sense of what our congregation is struggling with. And you can imagine that all of us good Presbyterians are struggling with the things that we would think that human beings are struggling with. Marriages, drinking, patience, anger, pornography, ourselves. All of us are asking Jesus to save us from these things. And Paul writes about this. And because Paul is not immune to this. Paul knows this internal struggle that we all carry on our daily lives of being sinners, but trying to be justified before God. Paul writes in chapter 7, I don't understand my own actions. Do not do what I want. I do the very thing that I hate. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good that I want, but, I, but the evil I don't want is what I do. So I find it to be a law. That when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law, or with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? You ever been in this situation in your own life, you good Presbyterian? Where you realize the gravity of sin and how that weighs upon your soul. Who will save me? And Paul writes, who will save me? 
Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's like the ultimate Sunday school answer, right, Jana? You ask any question, the answer is always Jesus. And while that seems so simple, Paul is saying that this is the reality of the world. Jesus is the answer to our sin. As Paul wrestled with sin in his letter to the church in Corinth, he writes about this thorn in his flesh, but he never tells us exactly what it is. A psychologist may have a field day of why that is. But Paul has a thorn in his flesh. And I don't want to say I know, but I know <laughs> that you have a thorn in your flesh as well. And Paul says that God tells him that this thorn in his flesh, this sin, is a reminder that Jesus' grace is sufficient for you. Paul does not say, I'm supposed to overcome this thorn in my flesh. Paul does not say, on my own will, I am able to do this. Paul says, my grace is sufficient for you. Who will save me? Not you. Jesus will save you from your sin. The past few weeks have been answering the first question, who is God, on the front of your bulletin. And if you haven't been here, in a nutshell... Sorry to all of you who have been here the past four weeks. In a nutshell, this is what I've been saying in two minutes. That so often we think of God as far away and we are by ourselves over here. But the reality of Christian Orthodox belief, theology, is that God is all around us, in front of us, behind us, that it is in God in who we live and move and have our being. There is nothing that can separate us from God unless we believe that we are separate from God. We sin when all this created stuff that God makes me and you, when we focus on family and not on God, when we focus on work and not on God, when we focus on religion and not on God. These Things of creation that we worship in disorder from remembering that God is the one in whom we move and dwell. This disordering leads us to sin. We are only separate from God when we believe that we are separate from God. And we know that Jesus is God incarnate, coming to remind us that God is very much close. Jesus' primary message, beginning in Mark chapter 1, repent and believe the good news. The kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is at hand. So this is the good news of Jesus. Jesus is the one who saves us from ourselves, from our sin. Paul writes later on, for whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So I want you to hear this, because so often we try to fix the sin in our lives. And Paul is telling us this is not the way to do it. Your will is too weak. The power of sin is too real. The only way you can be released from your sin is realizing that Jesus has already saved you from that and putting your faith and your trust and what Jesus has done for you, done for you. The opposite of sin for Paul is not good works. The opposite of sin is faith. So friends, if you are feeling the weight of sin in your own life, don't try to do this job on your own. You're going to fail. Because the reality of the universe is that there's only one entity that can save you. And that is God, who has already done that. So friends, let me encourage you to nurture your faith through Bible study. When was the last time you've dug deep into the Word? Through making worship a priority in your life. Ascribing glory and honor to the only thing that has ever mattered, which is God Himself. When was the last time you devoted yourself to prayers for you, for your family, for the world? Augustine was a theologian of the 4th century in the Confessions. 
he has this famous phrase, God, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. Friends, I have found this to be the truth of the world in which we live. Because sin is very real and present. You know that very well. We will not find rest until we find our rest in our Lord Jesus Christ. Which brings me to my conclusion. If you are lucky enough in life, you too will be in the same situation as the man that I encountered in this hostage room. If you're lucky enough, surrounded by loved ones, surrounded by excellent medical and spiritual care of our hospice friends, and you will be preparing to meet your maker. So the question is, in that room, what will your family be saying about you? What words will they use to describe you? And maybe more importantly, what will be happening in your own heart as you prepare to meet your Lord and Savior Jesus? Will you be wondering whether your sins are too great for Jesus to accept you? Or will you simply trust and believe? that Jesus, all of you sinners who are simultaneously justified and saints in God's eyes, is ready to carry you home to the promises that Jesus has been sharing with you all along. Will you believe? So friends, may we live in faith, in the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has overcome the power of sin in the world, who can overcome the power of sin in your heart, and may you find a holy rest for your weary soul in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Jesus has given his life for us that we may have life abundant and eternal. What will we give in return for God's grace in our life? Will the ushers come forward to us?